Well, it's really always a joy to be here, uh, particularly not being put in the immediate uh, post-lunch position. So I'm glad, I'm glad Andy was the sacrificial lamb for, uh, for that component. Uh, clearly, this is a wonderful meeting, and really congratulations to, to Dick and David, who really have partnered over the years in putting on such a special event. So really a great pleasure to be here. Now, Dick wanted me to kind of crystallize you know, a variety of the efforts that we've had ongoing to perhaps give a bit of a, of a human face, of an individual face, to the MPNs and how that really fits in the broader discussion of what we understand about the diseases as well as how we hope to treat them. So this is what to expect from your therapy on kind of a more broad theoretical basis. Now, some folks do ask, is a bit of an introduction to, to your speaker. Some of you have seen this horrendous slide before. But, you know, how does one get into a, a disease like this in terms of medical school and things of that nature? My mother saved this, uh, this picture from the 1980s. And indeed, in there, there's a, a whole section in there written in pencil in my report uh, on hydroxyurea. So... Uh, We've, we've, we've come a long way, but uh, still some things remain the same. Now, clearly, as we get together at a meeting like this, you know, really a lot of credit belongs to many folks. But in particular, I'd highlight uh, Joyce Niblack, you know, an MPN patient who was really one of the kind of uh, seminal moments where she really kind of challenged physicians to directly sit down with patients answer their questions, and have a direct one-to-one -one sort of conversation. And at the time, that was really quite unheard of, uh, and as you've seen, has become, fortunately, uh, much more commonplace uh, and a key part of our discussion. Now, really, the theme, you've heard a bunch of really wonderful talks from you know, my friends, my colleagues throughout the day, and I think, what are the key takeaways? Well, a key takeaway is that MPN patients are not all the same. I look around and I see an incredible spectrum of individuals in terms of life experiences, age, other health concerns, as well as a wide range just in terms of their MPNs. Indeed, MPN patients are affected in many ways. There are variable risks you've heard of today about vascular events, about blood counts, about concerns about progression, about issues of the spleen, big, small, the issue of symptoms, which we'll discuss more, but as well as the rest of your health. Indeed, nobody is just a disease, although you sometimes will label yourselves like that online. I'm, you know, I'm PV, you know, I, I'm blonde, I'm six feet, you know, and I've had PV for two years. Uh, but clearly, we are an amalgam of many things. Now, quality of life. Quality of life has many different components, and we're going to weave into that, because quality of life includes many things. It does include the direct symptoms that someone has from the disease, but includes many other things as well. The uncertainty of having a chronic disease. Indeed, as I have seen and have the honor of participating in many patients such events over the years, it really is the hunger for information for knowledge, a, a weapon, if you would, against the uncertainty. And there is an aspect of the hassle of medical care that really cannot be uh, understated. There's the issue that we're not all the same. There are patients with MPNs, although it frequently does get glossed over, that can be of reproductive age, and for many of them, this can be a major stressor. It's important to recognize MPNs have impact as well on financial and employment issues. Here's an abstract we will be presenting at ASH, but we're trying to better quantify what is the impact of an MPN on employment. I have known many patients who have perhaps retired early, perhaps cut back a bit on work, perhaps had issues with copayment for medications or being medically disabled. These can have very significant and issues that we've not really quantified to a great degree. And there clearly can be an impact on us emotionally. Performed a study last year, which many of you might have participated, where we see that there are issues of having an MPN in terms of anxiety, in terms of uncertainty for the future, uh, as well as impact not only on employment, 
but on how we have our activities of daily living or the events that we may uh, choose not to participate because we just don't feel up to it. And the issue of life expectancy. I mean, clearly everyone in this room is going to eventually pass away, except maybe Dick. But the rest of us... <laughs> I, 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 I think Dick's going to outlive us all. But, but, but truly, it's about, you know, is there an impact on what our natural trajectory in life is going to be? And, and it's important to recognize that MPNs are part of that discussion, but they don't necessarily trump everything else. Now, what about the symptoms themselves? Well, the symptoms are important for a variety of reasons. One, they are, can be just as important as other aspects that we can measure. We can measure your spleen. We can measure a hemoglobin. The symptoms don't necessarily trump those other things. doesn't make them less important, but it is important. And we do want to be able to quantify that. Next, the symptoms can be a clue. They are a clue of the biology of the disease. It, Andy, in that very uh, elaborate, if somewhat disturbing picture of those mice, but elaborate studies that showed how the issues of blood flow were very relevant and have impact in terms of symptoms. Gender and a diagnosis clearly can be a factor. And the issue of symptom burden is not necessarily the same thing as disease risk. So a few things we've learned. One, we needed a common way to measure these symptoms. We've developed a variety of questionnaires, the most recent being the MPN Symptom Assessment Form, they look really at five key areas, vascular symptoms, constitutional, spleen, fatigue, and quality of life. And with these, with your help, we have helped validate them in now about 5,000 patients globally in about 40 different countries. And what we've learned is that MPN patients are not too dissimilar around the world. We can compare patients from New York to Uruguay to Madagascar to New Zealand, and it is really quite similar indeed. Now as we look at the symptoms themselves, these are the 10 core symptoms, ET in blue, PV in red, MF in green. You see that in these 10 core symptoms, about half or more of MPN patients tend to have each of these symptoms. There's a couple exceptions, a couple that I put in my mind as signs of a bit more advanced disease. Weight loss can be a particularly concerning sign of movement further down the rabbit hole of myelofibrosis, fever, and bone pain. You'll see that fatigue is incredibly common, and itching is a particularly noteworthy issue for people with P-Vera. Now, as we've tried to compare between the diseases, we have used this approach that looks very colorful, and what this represents is information in about 2,000 patients with each quartile, Q1 through 4, increasing, increasing symptom burden. And what it shows is the overlap. The patients with myelofibrosis are the most symptomatic of the MPN patients. But it's important to know that there are certain patients with P-Vera who are much more symptomatic than certain patients with myelofibrosis. So the label your disease has is helpful, but clearly it does not tell us the whole story of what you're going through. Now, another way of looking at these symptoms, this is a study we've worked with Claire Harrison and her colleagues in the UK. This is what's called the spider plot, where we have the symptoms on the outside and the numbers in between. So one, they compared their UK population to our data set of patients with MPNs. And we see, as you see the lines overlap one another, the pattern is essentially identical. So it really tells us that there really is a very distinct pattern these are two completely different sets of patients, and their symptom profile is almost exactly the same as a population. We then compared with the general population, because there are times, as I'll be speaking to physicians, they'll kind of raise their hand and they'll kind of nod and say, well, you know, you say they're fatigued, and I'm fatigued, my wife's fatigued, we're taking our kids to soccer, you know, it's all well and good, but I don't buy that these patients feel worse than anybody else. 
Well, at least we can quantify uh, in a blinded way that it indeed, uh, compared to the general population, pretty much without exception, there is very significant difference between MPN patients and the general population. And this was just in patients with ET and P. vera, not even including the most symptomatic patients with MF. Now, another way we really want to try to understand this burden better is by comparing with other populations. So there is a questionnaire, the EQ5D, developed in Europe to quantify the issue of quality of life. And with this, there's five different uh, axes of information they explore. Mobility, self-care, activities, pain discomfort, anxiety, and depression. So this does not replace the MPN symptoms. It is a let's say, a complementary set of information. What we're presenting at this year's ASH is one, even in ET and PV, there are clearly very significant issues with these aspects on quality of life. Not for every ET and PV patient, but for many. We also found that there's high correlation with the MPN symptoms that we have identified. So this is undergoing further analysis, but will give us a much better sense how does an MPN patient compare with the population with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or other chronic diseases? Now, what about the issue of MPN risk? You've heard some of this discussion today, and I am raise it to kind of help frame it for you a little bit. Risk of what and what is it that is predictive? So first, when we say a concept of risk, what does that mean? Does that mean how long I'm going to live? Does that mean how likely I am to have a blood clot or a bleeding event? Does it mean my risk of suffering with a disease? Actually, none of these scores measure that at all. Uh, does it mean risk of change into acute leukemia or dying specifically from the disease as opposed to something else? Indeed, there have been many things that have been found in part based on variables that we can measure. Age, is it important? Of course it is. Our clinical features of the disease, blood counts, and mutation analysis. As we've looked at all the MPN scores put together, we clearly see that factors of prior blood clots, age, white count, all matter. What probably is underrepresented on here is really the details regarding the different symptom profile which I've mentioned. Now, it doesn't necessarily trump these things, but part of the challenge is that the, the way this information is gathered, people look in old medical charts and fill out a form and compare numerically, you know, the size of the spleen, the hemoglobin, etc. But we don't really have from old medical charts very good quantification of symptoms or even spleen size. So there are limitations why these things may not be there in terms of prediction. Now, what about our goals of treatment? I've shared with you clearly MPN patients have a lot of symptoms. They have a lot of burdens you've heard about today. Vascular events, risk of progression, splenomegaly, etc. So what are our goals? Well, one, I think our goals are clearly to try to help you in any way that we can. Clearly, most of our focus historically has been on an individual's physical health. So I could prevent you from having a blood clot. I could stop you from having a transfusion. I have hoped that I have given you some benefit. Clearly, events like this are put on by people like Dick and David to give you education to try to help you in other ways. And maybe that may help you in terms of the mental and emotional aspects of your health. As a MPN community, we recognize that we have a variety of goals that we assess in terms of response for a treatment. Improving symptoms, sure. Avoiding blood clots and bleeding, absolutely. Improving the appearance of the bone marrow, we hope that that is a benefit. Near normal blood counts. So these are some of the ways we measure therapies. So you hear about all of these different experimental drugs. Some of them might help one of these things. Some of them may help all of these things. And it just provides a playing field, uh, a set of metrics for us to compare. Now with the symptoms, we do know that a decrease in symptoms is important. It can be a sign of an agent being helpful or an or a intervention being helpful. It also can be a sign of improvement. Now, 
one way that we recommend is to really try to track these as an individual visits with their doctor. To receive a questionnaire, whether it be on a clipboard or some other way, where we have quantified what your symptoms have been in the past. And when you come back, whether you're on a phlebotomy, whether you're on a therapy, we try to see whether that has improved. Or if it's worsened, is it a sign that there's a change in your health? Now, that change in your health might be a change in the MPN, but of course it may not. It could sometimes be a sign of another medical problem that has surfaced as well. Indeed, it's important with a disease like this not to have blinders on, to only focus on your health in terms of the MPN, because unfortunately, having an uncommon disease like an MPN does not protect us from the other things that we can get. It doesn't protect us from heart disease or lung disease or our need to screen for colon cancer or other difficulties. So we must be mindful of our overall health. Now, what do measuring MPN symptoms teach us about the MPNs? Several different things. One, there clearly are gender differences. And this is independent of country. Now, there's a bunch of jokes I could come up with here, but rather than go down that, that path, I'll just leave that be. But there clearly is a gender difference, and we think that there's probably biological reasons for this that we should not ignore. Two, we know that the course of an MPN is important. We presented this year's ASH that the duration of having an MPN has a big impact on the MPN symptoms. There's a lot of patients who are symptomatic up front, but we are looking at really dealing with very chronic illnesses and have to be mindful of the factor of time and the impact that has on the evolution of the MPN. Next, we've done an analysis looking at the issue of phlebotomy. Is phlebotomy completely benign? It depends on the individual. But phlebotomy, although can have certain benefits, such as decreasing the risk of blood clots, certainly can have other detrimental effects, such as iron deficiency and symptoms that can be derived from that. We've also looked at these populations to assess other things that we can re assess retrospectively. Things such as hydria and anagrolide. Do these have a big impact on symptoms? These agents were really used before we developed these tools to really measure these things. But as far as we could tell, these agents as a population have not had a big impact on improving MPN symptoms. We've been able to identify unmet needs. We published just uh, very recently in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, looking at patients with PV that have difficult features. In patients who have failed hydria, for example, we have seen that these patients have quite a bit worse symptom profile than those that have not failed hydria. And we've identified, well, pockets of individuals who have worse difficulties. Patients with uh, myelofibrosis who have significant thrombocytopenia, people who are enrolling in the PERSIST study that Surge uh, is leading and many of us are participating in. This is a group of individuals that have a very difficult group of symptoms. Now, how do we optimize our current treatments? Well, I think there's many goals. Our goals are several. We're trying to decrease vascular events. We're trying to decrease symptoms. We're not only trying to decrease symptoms, we're really talking about a nuanced discussion. We're trying to help in a variety of ways. If cytopenias are a problem, ideally we'd like to improve them. If splenomegaly is a problem, ideally we would like to decrease it. And likewise, through Dick's discussion earlier today, we would like to delay progression. So how do we crystallize that? Well, where do I weave in symptoms in terms of thinking about treatment? For example, if I'm visiting with a patient with P. vera, I think their risk and their symptoms are both very important things I need to be aware of. And then control hematocrit, use low-dose aspirin, and from there I decide on the intervention of frontline therapy as well as second-line therapy such as ruxolitinib, of which you heard about. Likewise, in myelofibrosis, I view that that assessment of the symptoms and the risk are two key variables. And then really would look 
at risk and symptoms in terms of determining in a complex algorithm what really might fit best for that individual. The other key part is an individual's choice and understanding regarding therapies. There are complex therapies, as you've heard of, such as transplant, that clearly your input into that process is incredibly important. Now, what about evolving therapies? Well, I'll leave my comments not to the therapies themselves, but how we view the symptoms as being part of that. Indeed, as we try to look at assessing impact, transplant, reduction of splenomegaly, prolonging survival, preventing vascular events, avoiding progression, and improving symptom burden and quality of life. I don't think one of these things trump the others, nor do they trump those key aspects of yourself, your prognosis, your risk, your choice and input, all key factors. You've heard much about interferon. As we evaluate therapies like interferon, the clean clear question whether interferon will become, let's say, an FDA-approved therapy in the U.S. is part of the discussion, what is the benefit, but also what is the impact? Are there negatives? And how are those things quantified? When Serge or I or others sit before the FDA, that is exactly the question they ask. What is the net benefit a patient can experience? What is the clinical benefit? As we look at the JAK2 inhibitors, that certainly has been central in that the improvement in symptoms has been central in this entire class of drugs in terms of their assessment. I helped to lead these studies with picretinib, and this was a prime example where we were using an agent that was helpful and could be used in people that had low platelets that had not had availability to receive ruxolitinib. And with them, we were able to report at this year's ASCO improvement in symptoms and why this was important, this was a group that really did not have a good alternative. We were also able to measure by asking the patients directly through the patient's global impression of change, were they better off? The approval of ruxolitinib in polycythemia vera was a very similar sort of discussion. It was improvement in spleen, improvement in hematocrit, and improvement in the symptoms whether we looked at individual symptoms or an aggregate. All of these things were factors in terms of that consideration. As we look at other drugs in development, the Prometeor drug, which Serge likely touched base on, that works against fibrosis, can help to improve symptoms. The combinations that Serge said, let me this slide, but as we look at all of these combinations, there's so many trials ongoing at the moment, I think that we are evaluating their benefit on many parameters of which improvement Improvement in your symptoms is one key part. Second, making sure that it's not bringing other toxicities that really negate the benefits that we see. Indeed, as I think about, let's say, myelofibrosis as an example, if someone decreases their spleen, decreases symptoms, has an improvement in survival, how we might see further benefit might be decreased fibrosis, decreased cytopenias, perhaps improved molecular response, or perhaps extension of the benefits. Now, finally, I'd say it's key that we not lose the forest through the trees. You know, if we think about the overall journey that a patient walks with a disease like MPNs, medicines are part of that journey, but it's not the journey itself. The only discussion is really around pills that is clearly only part of the story. Indeed, everyone asks me this question, what should I eat? And indeed, no one truly knows. Everyone has a different diet, a different idea. Eating well undoubtedly is important for your health. What is exactly beneficial for one individual, I can't say that our medicine has yet gotten to that point. Physical activity, this is very important. For some people, it's just walking. Just walking in Central Park, walking down uh, First Avenue, uh, yoga, other activities. But if you're not active, your health will deteriorate. Indeed, enhancing your quality of life relies on many things. Perhaps not climbing up this cliff, but, but many things. 
Now, we were involved with a study trying to understand the aspect of fatigue and what do people employ to try to help to improve their fatigue. What we asked uh, and found that patients are doing a variety of different things. But we also found that patients really do struggle with issues of mood-related impact with the uncertainty of having an MPN. We found in terms of fatigue itself, there are certain things that can aggravate fatigue and certain things that can help. Certain things that can help are not all medical. They're not all activity. It can be setting priorities. It can be socializing. It can be labor-saving devices. It can be really having being part of a community. Our group has become interested in yoga uh, as one resource that people can employ. There's a trial which we launched, the M3 trial, the Myeloproliferative Neoplasm Meditative Movement Trial. This is a trial along with our colleagues at Arizona State University who are exercise physiologists in which we developed a specific program that was specific to MPN patients with modifications for splenomegaly to try to assess the impact of an online yoga uh, intervention. This trial uh, launched uh, just a little over a month ago. Uh, and with this, uh, we actually accrued the entire study uh, within a two-week period, in part due to uh, all of the enthusiasm uh, uh, patients had really expressed for this and really demonstrating that we're probably really only scratching the surface in terms of an unmet need as people really want to feel empowered in other ways to try to uh, intervene against their disease. So we're hoping to learn more from this as well as develop resources that both on trials but also outside of clinical trials so people can access these resources when they are appropriate. So I'll leave you with these thoughts. The issues of really optimizing an MPN treatment is really a mindset. Realizing that everyone is an individual and really viewing a journey with a chronic disease as trying to be a survivor, to having the MPN be as little an impact on your life as it can be. 10 key ways I think people can be empowered to be an MPN survivor. Learning more about your disease, you're doing that right here. Making friends facing a similar challenge, again, we can check that box off. We have that lovely lunch outside between the buildings. Beautiful spot, Dick. Eight, being your own best advocate. Understanding your disease is very important. Capture what is discussed at the doctor's visits. Indeed, I'm very comfortable, uh, and as are many of my colleagues, having you record the discussion. Now, clearly only do that after you have your provider's permission, but now that every phone can really be a recorder, it really can be helpful. It's a dense discussion, and sometimes you really want to, you know, what exactly did they say? Six, taking care of your caregiver or really your support system. Some folks have bristled at this term caregiver. Yeah, I have people that are really helping me. I don't really want to call them a caregiver. Fine. You know, but we all have people who really are our support, uh, and we really need to be mindful uh, of taking care of their needs as well. Number five, I can't emphasize enough, taking care of the rest of your health. I clearly have seen individuals who have ignored other serious medical problems because they have put their MPN front and center and have sometimes really ignored other diseases that might be much more life-threatening. So your whole health is important. Eat in a healthy way, at least most of the time. Exercise, live every moment, and focus on relationships. So a few folks I would like to thank. First, my group in Arizona that has been instrumental in many of these efforts. Additionally, most of the efforts that I've shown you regarding symptoms of quality of life really are from friends, colleagues, and clearly you, the MPN patient community that have participated in these activities. And finally, clearly, MPN patients rock. <laughs> so here's one of my patients. He's, he's quite a character, but he's got this epic P. Vera tattoo. Uh, he's got Jack 2 positivity here. <laughs> The story is quite funny because he's telling me as he's trying to explain to the tattoo artist about P. Vera. 
and uh, that was really quite unique. And then here's a slide shared with me by, uh, by Claire's patients who made her a whole series of MPN treats for the, uh, for the folks at Guys and St. Thomas's. So with that, Dick and David, again, my thanks.